Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Are we recording? Yeah. Thanks again for talking with me. This is kind of a really big moment for me because when I was first becoming politicized as a teenager, I listened to your music a lot. Oh, and right so this on. is the, like really cool uh, to That's talk to you. Great. That's a great time of the life uh, to be listening to music. <laughs> Whatever you were listening to as a teenager, you remember for the rest of your life. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's such a privilege to have been doing it long enough to actually, like, uh, you know, have people growing up listening to my music. It's, it's a function of getting old. You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. But uh, just to kick it off, tell us a little bit about your new album. Why did you decide to record it now? What's the sort of like idea behind the album? It, the new album, it was basically, I mean, it's like a multiple, multi-instrumental two-country production um, because of the Oregon Employment Department, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be, you know, to be perfectly straightforward about <laughs> it, like the fact that I, we got it finally after waiting for seven months for them to, uh, you know, gig, we I lost all my gigs, mm -hmm. of course, as a, you know, like 65% uh, of artists in the U.S. became fully unemployed uh, with the onset of the pandemic. And here in Oregon, at least for many of us, it took seven months to get on unemployment. For others, I think they're still waiting. I mean, the, the system is so broken. It's like it's run on 1980s uh, software, you know, but, uh, you know, the computer system for the Oregon Employment Department. Mm -hmm. But basically uh, the uh, the album, I wanted to make an album, but it ended up being a, a better sort of like a more uh, the kind of thing that I like to do when I can, which, which involves drums, bass and more instruments because uh, we could you know afford to do it because of the uh, employment department. To <laughs> but otherwise, it's basically in terms of the content on it, it's basically pretty much well, all the songs are are were written in the space of the from late fall 2019 till late fall 2020 and so mostly they kind of tell the story of the pandemic at least uh, some parts of the story mm -hmm. yeah and one of the sort of like big i would say through lines of both this album and your last couple is the black lives matter movement and i know that that was a big deal in portland where you are uh, mm -hmm. and you have like an, the ballad of tear gas ted is a big favorite uh, right. among us in the New York activist scene right now. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like how you feel your music interacts with the movement and sort of what's going on in Portland now. There's been a lot going on in Portland. And uh, I mean, as, as everybody knows, and, <laughs> and, you know, and that, it's so interesting to, to try to like, you know, people usually are asking about the history of why is there so much going on in Portland? And that is a very interesting and complicated uh you know thing that goes back way back to the 19th century i'd say mm -hmm. in many ways but um but the um but it's been um, i mean it's been amazing that, th that there's been so much happening and it really has been surprising to me because uh the city has been i mean my at least in terms of local activism and in terms of a lot of songwriting, my, I guess you could say main focus has been around the housing crisis mm -hmm. in this country and, uh, and many other countries and the whole right of housing as a fundamental right and rent control. And, you know, the whole question of like, how can we, we none of no, no social spending policies will ever have do anything for us unless we have control over the cost of housing. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, and control of ba other basic expenses in life. But, you know, as anybody who, you know, understands basic math goes like <laughs> if, you know, if the cost of, you know, everything rises, then it doesn't matter if you're being paid $20 an hour or $50 an hour or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, if the rent has to be a certain amount, otherwise it's not affordable. Yeah. And, you know, but um, the um, so let's see now now where was i going with that wonderful tangent it's great interviewing people because when they go off on a tangent i can just ask another question you know and they, can, <laughs> they don't have to seem stupid but where, where was i going with that what was what we're was talking that? about uh what's going on in portland oh yeah so uh what's been happening has been uh i mean it has been an amazing amazing convergence of multiple uh, what you could call multiple movements, uh, but I would say they're all, it's all part of the same movement as people are, you know, as, as it's becoming more and more clear, like you can't be in favor of racial justice without being in favor of housing justice. I mean, this city, the, the, what we could call the ethnic cleansing of this city between 20, 2000 and 2010 was a function of gentrification, not a function of police brutality, not a function of the historic racism in, of this city or this state, which is a huge thing. I mean, racism and white supremacy is why 
Oregon white as it is, you know, quite simply. Mm -hmm. uh, but but there is a population of many different people of color in Portland and elsewhere in Oregon. And this population was growing mm -hmm. until the uh, city became so expensive. And now only parts of that population is growing. Other parts are shrinking. And especially during the most... Uh, uh, I mean, the beginning of the process of, of gentrification. Apparently, the numbers are not declining as uh, like they were uh, between 2000 and 2010. But between those two censuses, this city lost half of its black population. So oh, wow. it's like, you know, clearly the racial justice, housing justice, these things are impossible to to dis disentangle, as, as impossible as disentangling racial justice from police brutality. I mean, they are mm -hmm. all completely intertwined. And, uh, and that is becoming more and more clear to more and more people, certainly around here. That, uh, so all of this is, is coming together in, in really interesting ways. But in terms of my own participation and like my music and stuff like that, I mean, it's like, you know, with the isolation of the pandemic um, that, you know, especially at the beginning, you know, before... I mean, you know, they're even at the protests, there, there is often no music. I mean, there's often people are scared to sing. Yeah, I mean, understandably, of course, you know, that we're all we're all worried about the virus. And, and, you know, certainly we were more worried about it before and before we started getting the hang of how to deal with, mm -hmm. you know, pandemic life. But um, but the uh, just like the fact that, you know, you go to a protest, everybody's wearing masks, you know. I mean, even if I did recognize somebody, I often don't recognize them when they have a mask on. You know, I'm always really impressed when people recognize me with a mask on. Like, how, how do you how did you even do that? You know, like, how did you even know who I was? You know, I mean, but I mean, it's um, it's great that. I keep on hearing from people who are saying well, I'm at a protest and I'm listening to music because mm -hmm. if I weren't getting those emails and those messages and stuff, I would have no idea really how, mm -hmm. you know, that I was as relevant as I am to, to some people in, in the scene. And, and it's incredibly heartwarming to know okay. when it's easy to really feel isolated, including for me in this uh, pandemic and, and if it's easy for me to feel isolated with living with a happy family and having thousands of fans around the world, I can't imagine mm. how it's like for people who are actually isolated. Like one in four households in this country is a person living alone. Mm. And they're not people that know thousands of people around the world for the most part, most of them probably. Right. And so I just, I just don't, I just can't imagine, but it's been, it's been so heartwarming to get all these messages from, you know, especially like teenagers who seem to be more inclined to send messages on Twitter or whatever, like say, Hey, I'm listening to music at a, I don't think older people, they might be listening, but they don't bother messaging, me, <laughs> and, which is sad because it, I don't know if they realize how great it is to be the artist totally. receiving those messages. You know? <laughs> it's amazing. So have you, uh, you sort of like recalibrated how you are, thinking about music and thinking about putting out music now that it's kind of a more isolated listening experience, right? Like you, the live concerts are different. You can't sing mm -hmm. at protests anymore. Has that shifted the way you think about music or no? It hasn't, it hasn't shifted the way I think about music. It's, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's, I still use it as a tool for popular education and as a tool for teaching people about history and, and, and to be part of what's happening and to, you know, to comment on things in the way that people would comment in a, in an article or something, but I'm doing it in a song and in articles. But, um, you know, I think there's a, a real role to play for music regardless. Um, but it's just a lot less fun, uh, basically <laughs> when you're doing it all in your living room, because you know, all the, all the sort of, I mean, and, but I do get used to it over time and that is definitely the case. And then, and it's very interesting. I mean, and it's not all bad. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting mixed bag, the experience and, and it's, um, I mean, in a way, it feels like, like I have a 15 year old daughter and, and mm -hmm. two much younger children, but, but she, the, the, my teenager is very much involved, obviously, with the internet and, you know, lots mm -hmm. of different stuff on the internet. And I've always noticed, I mean, not, not even just teenagers, but people that are only just like, even just like maybe 15 years younger than me, who really totally grew up with the internet, which mm -hmm. I did not, um, you know, uh, they are much more able to it's all much more real uh, for, well, I guess you guys, <laughs> like it's more real, like the, what's happening online, it feels more real to you than it does to many older people who, for whom things don't feel real unless you're in the physical world. Like, you know, and I think that's changing for a lot of older people that we're, we're getting more accustomed to interacting online for better or for worse. And, uh, and it's, and it's feeling more real. So, 
you know, in, and there's ways that we learn to adapt. We humans learn to adapt to the online experience mm -hmm. that makes it feel more real. And there's a lot of little subtle things. And I'm sure platforms like Zoom are going to get more uh, better at simulating the mm -hmm actual experience of being in a room together because zoom does not simulate that experience <laughs> and, <No. laughs> and if if zoom did experience did simulate that i think it would become immensely popular and much more uh it would, it would be a much more relaxing experience if it would if it could simulate uh, the experience of actually being in a room together i think but it, i mean it still wouldn't it's not going to make up for mm -hmm. i mean it's just going to it's always better in the real world i think for totally. most of us you know i mean i i'm glad for those people who are actually enjoying this experience of the pandemic more than they were enjoying things in the real world i know that is the case for some people and i'm i'm happy for them but but, but for most of us it's it's mostly not fun <laughs> compared to being in the real world i mean for a touring musician i mean to say nothing of the economics which of course yes <laughs> but um you know going on tour and playing for actual audiences who clap at the end of the songs and cheer and sing along mm -hmm. is just completely different than the silence that you get, you know, mm -hmm. after you sing a song on Zoom. <laughs> you mentioned um, that you view your songs as popular education, which is actually something that I kind of wanted to ask about, because I see, I think one of the sort of most defining uh, elements of your work is this really interest in telling the stories of like important historical struggles and figures and things like that. And I was wondering if you could talk about like how you came to be sort of so dedicated to you know, talking about history and why you think it's so important to use music in that way. I guess when did I first get into it? I think, um, I guess, um, yeah, I guess <clears throat> it's all, it's always, I always have trouble remembering far back enough to, to <laughs> think about like what happened first, you know, but definitely when I was young and I first uh, got exposed, um, I mean, what comes to mind is, is listening to this one album of Bob Dylan. I mean, as cliche as that is, mm -hmm. I mean, but his album that has uh, the lonesome death of Hattie Carroll mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and North Country Blues and all these other uh, incredibly powerful songs that tell stories um, about recent history. In his case, you know, those songs were mostly telling stories about things that had just happened in the past year, around mm -hmm. 1960 or so. And um, the death of um, of uh, Med Grevers, and I mean, those songs just told such powerful uh, stories. And um, and then I, I got exposed to lots of other great mm -hmm. storytelling songwriters, um, ultimately in many different languages and parts of the world. And, and this whole tradition is it's a it's a huge tradition that that mm -hmm. far far transcends genre or language or anything like that. This tradition of, of using songs to tell stories, um, which we can call, of course, popular education, mm. um, to use, I think, a term that's that's a wonderful term that, that uh, you know, I mean, of course, it, it kind of, uh, you know, it sounds kind of formal when you talk, talk, mm -hmm. call it education, but but the, the tradition of popular education as a as a thing is it's is a very important uh, left wing tradition of, yeah. of bringing, you know, you know education to to the masses you know as to use a, an old <laughs> term but uh you know to, that, that this is for everybody you know this is not mm -hmm. just for the uh, people who can afford to go to college and actually um some of the best ways to learn about uh history and, and current events is through the arts and um and and that's also something that's important for i think uh, to 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 get that information out there more broadly that actually the ways that people are are getting educated in many uh, in, in at, at, you know that the academic forms of education actually are very limited i mean mm -hmm. in in uh, there's a lot of very important extremely important things about ac academic uh, research and about actually writing books that that really thoroughly uh, get into a subject uh, whether it's about history or current events or science mm -hmm. or any number of other things that that stuff is like cannot be overstated in terms of how important all that is mm -hmm. but at the same time when we're trying to communicate to the general public public about anything uh you know academia really falls short mm -hmm. and so do a lot of other you know um uh, you know sort of vehicles for trying to communicate and i think in many different circles uh using music and poetry and uh theater and and film as uh forms of of uh, really communicating stories and and, and teaching about history and current events and mm -hmm. concepts I and mean, it's it's really um 
you know, maybe film is, is more employed by those who can afford to do it. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, songs are really overlooked in a lot of different uh, societies. And that's been especially the case since the advent of the music industry, because for the past you know, century or so with this basically white supremacist uh, industry uh, dominating the cultural landscape of the United States, the United Kingdom and many other countries, um, which is a explicitly racist industry, uh, you know, to say nothing of its other problems. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it the music industry has done as single handedly or not single handed, but they have done the more than anybody to to destroy music as a tool, as a useful tool, because all they they have just taught us that, first of all, the only relevant thing to sing about is something that happens in your bedroom. And if it's not something that happens in your bedroom, it's not <laughs> relevant to sing about, basically. You know, that's one message. And the other message is, the music is a bunch of there, the, there are these different genres the genres don't i mean recently that's changing but but for most of the history of the music industry there are these genres there are these boxes you know you belong in this box you belong in that box mm -hmm. if you're black you have no chance of getting anywhere uh you know in in these other genres you have to stay in your genre and you know that kind of thing and that's uh that's still the way the industry works, but, but it's, but it's, it's changing a little bit, but it's also collapsing. <laughs> so that's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that helps industries change for the better, for better, or for worse, you know, both in, in the case of the music industry, I'd say. Well, on that thing about the uh, music industry is you've written a lot of songs. And in fact, actually the closing uh, song of the most recent album are all about sort of trying to survive. And I guess that we can call it the Spotify age. Right. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could talk about like, what's the material reality like of trying to be a, independent, you know, left-wing music artist in what was already, as you put it, a white supremacist music system and that's now become even harder to make a living in. Yeah. I mean, like, so the the um i mean basically in terms of the mainstream of the music industry and and the the sort of you know basically white supremacist model of of the music industry i mean that um that's nothing that i've particularly had anything to do with because i've been mm -hmm. outside of the music industry i mean i i'm i know something about it and i think it's a fascinating subject in terms of like the music the the mainstream music industry and these boxes and these genres and the racism and all that i think it's fascinating and 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 uh and important to know about, but but for me, in terms of my own uh, experiences, I've existed outside of that <laughs> realm because I've never been signed to a label. I've never been played on commercial radio. Um, you know, I mean, I've never been signed to any kind of label that involved more than a handful of people. You know, mm. usually like one. You know, <laughs> but uh, you know, so um, but um, the uh, so basically. For independent artists, whether you are political or not, um, in the 80s and 90s, um, and I actually just wrote an essay in Counterpunch that kind of gets into this in some detail. But in the 80s and 90s, um, it was like the golden age, really. I mean, it's weird to say because looking at back then, I would never have said that. Of course, you don't know yeah. what's going to come later, <laughs> how bad things are going to get or how, you know, in different ways. But basically, at that time, you know, you wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't have the kind of fan base that you can develop on necessarily that you can not necessarily that you will but you can develop on on streaming platforms the kind of you know international fan base that that's you know now potentially easier to develop than in it than ever before but what you could do in the 80s and 90s was make a decent living um mm -hmm. by touring and playing playing concerts and selling cds and cassettes and vinyl and whatever else because basically i mean there people could copy cassettes and they could copy cds and and by the late 90s you know copying you know pi what they call piracy or or you know free mp3s be started becoming a phenomenon but for the most part even through the noughties really up until the time that spotify started their free tier and i think that is really kind of and from my experience that that should that, that that'd be hard to overemphasize because even while piracy was rife as they say you know even as the the big three record labels were freaking out by the collapse of their whole economic model and by piracy completely undermining their whole economic model and by governments uh, uh, doing nothing about it and big tech uh, not only doing nothing worse than doing nothing really promoting it in, in many ways uh, you know, um, and and this is, and I'm not saying pirate. I'm not put, putting a, a label on it in terms of good or bad. I'm just saying this is the, the phenomenon of illegal mm -hmm. downloading was basically encouraged by big big tech. It destroyed the big three labels, but it did not destroy the ind independent music scene. To as far as I'm concerned, I mean, from my personal experience, and I know everybody's 
you know, different artists have different experiences in different countries. And I'm not trying to say, you know, this is necessarily everybody's experience. But my experience was you, you couldn't find all my music on any pirated uh, platform. People didn't do that to um, most independent musicians. People did that to the pop stars. And mo mm -hmm. I think actually most people are pretty ethical uh, actors. And uh, d despite whatever they say, and, and despite the fact that you can run into lots of trolls and fascists on Twitter and whatever <laughs> else, most people are good people. And most people actually don't want to, you know, impoverish an artist that they like. And they will download uh, for lots of free tracks of pop stars because they assume, often rightly, that the pop stars are doing fine. And they mm -hmm. don't. And, 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 you know, if it's a big deal for you to spend 15 bucks at, at a store and buy a CD and you can get their album for free by, with one click, obviously, a lot of people are going to do that. But with independent artists, especially the low, you know, lower on the rungs of, of uh, fame. You know, I don't think, uh, you know, it wasn't like you could easily find everybody's music for free download, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, so people like me, we gave away, I gave away my music um, on purpose, which mm -hmm. people thought was crazy. A lot of people thought was crazy. But now, um, I think in the, in the modern era, everybody understands uh, the value of data. Mm -hmm. And um, and people understand now uh, um, that, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I was giving away my songs and I would get an email address when somebody would download a song. <laughs> I mean, you know, now it's like you don't even have to explain wh mm -hmm. why it's so valuable, why mm -hmm. it's so worthwhile to give away a song in exchange for an email address, you know, uh, from somebody who likes the song and wants to get on your email list. I mean, that is like, you know, that's... Uh, you know, I don't, I don't get all the, into the business end totally. of it, but that's, you know, that's a big deal. And, but 20 years ago, nobody, very few people really understood that. And so, you know, that would be like, oh, you're giving away your, your music. And well, no, it's kind of actually, it's a strategic marketing. <laughs> it's, it's strategic marketing is what it is really, you know, but uh, I mean, so, uh, you know, I, I did okay during that. I did fine during that period. And, but when things started falling apart, uh, financially in terms of merch sales was when St Spotify started their free tier. So when they started their free tier in 2013, suddenly, you know, all basically all the world's music was available for free if you didn't mind sitting through one advertisement every 30 minutes. And, you know, whereas, you know, much of the world's music was available for free before 2013, if you were willing to illegally download something and face the possibility of getting some malware on your hard drive, you know, but actually most people weren't. They didn't want to, you know, a lot of people didn't want to do that. And, and then, but m probably more importantly, I, I think much more importantly is people who were subscribed to Spotify in 2013, whether they were on the free tier or paying, they thought, which understandably, because why, you know, why not? You think you, you want to be optimistic. You want to think the world's yeah. not as messed up as it is. People assumed that artists like me were getting money when you play our music. And so people assumed, and I would hear people, I still hear from people all the time. They say, oh, I just leave you going, you know, cause I, hopefully you're getting something out of this, you know, cause I just, you know, well, no, actually, you know, the, it, Spotify doesn't really pay, you know, <laughs> real money, uh, you know, so um, no, we're not benefiting from this. In fact, uh, it's Spotify has basically destroyed uh, the music industry globally, um, single-handedly by starting their free tier in 2013 and um i mean cd sales for independent artists like me just you know basically just collapsed i i know some others that didn't do as badly but their are their fans are mostly older and they mostly never put their stuff up on digital for the for, in the first place you know but uh for me it was just complete you know basically a collapse of half of my income and and for a lot of other people you know, mm -hmm. but and I'm, and i'm not saying people should not use spotify or anything like that i'm just saying that basically once the you know once like you know somebody builds the highway and and it's free to use and you know, you know you're, you're you're basically your taxes have built this highway and then you know somebody's saying well but that highway shouldn't be there uh you know i think we should all be you know walking uh on the path you know on the paths with with machetes and and you know hacking at the thorns you know but <laughs> you know, most people are gonna say sorry I, that might be the ethical thing to do but i'm gonna take the highway <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah. You know? i mean it's the highway we need to you know we need to do something about the structure of the highway you know and not mm. not uh not try to set up alternative i mean i think basically spotify needs to be 
regulated, whether that's through, you know, government regulation or because, you know, people like, you know, smash all their corporate in offices in every country that they have them and, and make them start listening to reason or, you know, whatever, you know, or peaceful, nonviolent, civil disobedience, whatever it's going to take. I don't really care. Um, but something's got to uh, bring Spotify to heel because this is a vulture capitalist um, entity that, that it has done more to destroy uh, the arts than any other corporation in the history of the world. And, um, and this, um, you know, they, they are the Uber of, uh, you know, of the music industry, you know, what Uber is to the taxi industry, Spotify is to the music industry. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's a really important uh, thing to think about that. I think that oftentimes uh, I'm also uh, in the arts and I think that the thing that we, uh, when we talk about a lot of artists, we kind of all assume that they're like the pop star, right? In a way that I think that it's really important for you to talk about things like this. And you've been so vocal about it, which is really great is that like for the vast majority of artists on Spotify, they can't earn a living that like, if you're Britney Spears, if you're Madonna, you're fine, you know, but yep. like the vast majority of independent artists are really, really struggling. Uh, and so thank you for your advocacy around that. I mean, it's it's actually a really a, a very interesting moment, like specifically, I mean, very specifically, like in three days, uh, three days, two days. What? How many days are in March? 30, 31? Uh, the first is Thursday. OK, on Thursday, um, SoundCloud is launching uh, a new streaming platform and, um, and and it may or may not be a big deal because they don't have sign on from the big three record labels but they do have 100,000 independent artists that are on the label uh, on on the platform including me and on april 1st uh you know when soundcloud launches this new uh music streaming platform what's interesting about it is that their royalty distribution or their you know their their payout model is going to be based on how much of an artist people actually listen to which which sounds like really obvious that, that <laughs> they should all they should all be using that model but this is not the model that spotify and other platforms use and so the thing is that what's so incredibly unfair about spotify and these other platforms is not just that the payout is so bad uh as to be making it impossible to support an industry on this basis because you know pe people have to have mm -hmm. People have to make enough money to be able to afford afford to re record something, you know, for in the first yeah. place, let alone to pay the rent, you know. But um, but the uh, what is what is what is SoundCloud's new model will result, according to their math, in basically basically if your listeners are like the typical listeners of an independent artist, which typically independent artists will listen people who like independent artists will listen to like an album much more often than they'll listen to a hit because we don't have hits right mm -hmm. so if you have a hit uh like if you look at say i mean one of my favorite bands chumbawamba if you look at what yeah. you know and they <laughs> completely love everything they've done amazing but, uh, yeah i mean when you but when you look at them on on spotify uh you will find that the overwhelming majority of the one and a half million monthly listeners that they have are a result of their one hit, which is a fucking great song, Tub Thumping. But <laughs> they have so many other great songs, and that that is not that's not responsible for. But um, this is so that's so basically, you know, uh, listening patterns vary, but the the uh, the the platforms don't take that into account. And by not taking that into account, what they're doing is they're uh, immensely benefiting anybody who's on the big three record labels, mm -hmm. basically anybody who's on commercial radio and even more disadvantaging independent artists who are already disadvantaged by not being well known in the first place, you know? So it's like this, it's this, you know, uh, you know, that's, I mean, forget about even, we you know, to even removing any issues of like, uh, you know, you know, race or class or, or geography into the whole thing, but just the basic structure of it for anyone in, independent or, major label is like very very unequal you know and then and then we're told that we're not supposed to um you know basically all these platforms have some kind of agreement like saying where and i don't know how many people abide by it but it says don't talk about how much you're making you know mm. and and that's another way of like okay so then we're not supposed to talk about what we're making so then how is anybody supposed to know how how much we're being paid you know so mm -hmm. i think it's it's really important that people talk about what they're making and and a lot of people don't want to talk about it because they're making so little and they don't want to admit that because somehow like because they have they know they have fans they they want to think that 
you know, they're, they must be, they want, they don't want to admit to themselves how little they're making, you know, mm -hmm. but if you get a million streams a year on Spotify, you will make somewhere between one and $2,000 a year. Wow. And that is a fact. And that is a fact because I get a million streams a year on Spotify. So I can tell you that unequivocally, that's how much you'll make from it. And I mean, more like 2000. That's so messed up. <laughs> the whole, the whole <laughs> industry is so broke. Uh, but thanks for sharing that. And you mentioned, I uh, kind of want to go off a thing you're talking about, about like um, the sort of role of political art a few, a few minutes ago, um, which is that you've been making uh, political art uh, pretty consistently since the nineties. And I was just wondering, so that's obviously like a lot of changes have happened in our political landscape, right? Like you have anti-Bush songs, you have anti-Obama songs, you have anti-Trump songs. And now as we're sort of entering the Biden era, like what do you think the role of, your work in political art kind of writ large is in the current moment with the pandemic and the economic crisis and the rise of the right and Biden and everything. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's, I think so many different uh, important roles to play and they're all pretty much the same basic role that, you know, the, 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 the um, sort of political education can play mm -hmm. in any kind of, um, you know, time, but of course the times change in so many ways. So it's always, um, I mean, one of the things that I think, um, is interesting, um, about the present moment is, uh, you know, of course, as, as some, as a member of, you know, basically as a, you know, somebody far to the left of Biden, let's just say, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, my inclination is to, uh, join in, uh, so many of my friends who are far to the left of Biden, who um, who have all kinds of very important criticisms of his policies. And I, of course, I do have all kinds of criticisms and I make them all the time. But uh, what strikes me about this current situation, uh, which is a bit different from any other time in my life when there's been a Democrat in power, is that it just feels like his hold on power is so tenuous um, and, and the possibility of a uh, of a large scale uh, far right uh, movement um, in this country um, getting much bigger and much more powerful than it is now uh, or that it was under Trump is very worrying. And the possibility that we are in a basically Weimar moment with Biden uh, as the last um, democratically elected uh, leader before something really bad happens. Uh, I mean, it, uh, I don't know that that's the future. I'm not predicting that at mm -hmm. all, but I'm just saying that it, that based on my understanding of history and current events, uh, this is a very precarious moment in many different ways. And I think uh, whatever positions we're taking, um, we need to think about how precarious this moment is. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that needs to be part of the calculation for however we're singing or talking or, or, or discussing or writing about uh, the situation now. Um, you know, th I don't think the solution, whatever the solution is, the solution um, in terms of discourse is not um, just... Um, basically uh taking more of a you know sort of entrenching ourselves more in our corners and uh and and having more uh you know in increasing the level of of uh angry rhetoric and and uh violence and conflict uh between uh the increasingly factionalized uh elements of our society i you know i'm not i'm not suggesting that we can have some kind of a uh, reconciliation or, or understanding uh, with the far right. But I think we need to be communicating with people who mm -hmm. don't agree with our positions, whoever we are. I'm just saying generally, broadly, we need to be actually communicating and we need to know, we need to understand that, you know, the survival of our species and of some semblance of a society is what we want uh, more than, um, you know, paradise on earth you know i mean we need to we need to prevent fascism in this country and we need to prevent the destruction of life on earth and we need to make sure people are housed and fed and like those basic uh priorities i think uh should be in top in people's minds um you know at this at this stage you know there's, it's a very precarious moment and you know yeah. I'm not saying people shouldn't be uh, sticking up for anything that, that's important or that they shouldn't be horribly offended by the opinions of the right, but they're not going to go away if mm. we ignore them. They're not going to disappear. They're going to grow. 
and we need to acknowledge that and we need to figure out what we're going to do about it. But shooting them or ignoring them is not the solution. Sure. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, and sort of a, a final question. Um, just, you know, I think you're really a uh, great example, as we've talked about, of like somebody who's really persevered through a bunch of different eras making really unapologetically left-wing art. And I was just wondering if there are any sort of up-and-coming political artists who are watching or reading this right now, what advice would you offer to them? What advice you have for young, you know, left-wing folk singers right now, you know? Yeah, I would, um, and I would, first of all, I would, uh, anybody, any any young um, musicians out there who are trying to survive in uh, this era or just try, or just uh, making uh, music, whether you're trying to make any kind of you know, living off of it. Um, I wrote a, a booklet uh, called How to Be a Troubadour, which I've never published, but which I will happily share with anybody who emailed <laughs> I will send you back uh, a PDF uh, with this booklet. Um, and it's uh, basically my best effort at sort of summarizing what I do in terms of like how to write songs and how to make a living at this, um, which is basically an update of the booklet I wrote for PM Press in 2006, um, which is on the same subject, but which is basically uh, at least half of it is completely irrelevant now mm -hmm. because it was written in a time when you made half of your income from selling CDs. So it's so <laughs> weird looking at that booklet. It's like, oh my gosh, this was like written in the dinosaur age. Like, <laughs> how many times do I say the word CD in this damn thing? You know? <laughs> God. So the new one is was written three years, four years ago now. So it's actually, um, you know, it's actually, you know, it's actually quite dated in some ways, but it's way more current than that booklet was because it was written in the in after the collapse of the of the independent music industry and the rise of Spotify and the rise of crowdfunding. Um, so basically, I mean, my advice, the most basic advice I would say is, um, I, I mean, I guess I'd have a lot of advice, but the first thing that comes to mind is, um, is, is, is you, it's so easy to discount your value and um, the value of what you're doing and how much it might be appreciated by other people because there's too much out there uh, that people are doing generally. There's just too much stuff out there on the web generally. And very few people are actually making any money at putting out stuff on the web other than the big tech platforms. Of course, they're mm -hmm. making lots of money. But the people who are putting out the content, for the most part, except for some very you know successful viral sensations, you know, most of us are not making much money on the web from these kinds of you know things so it's easy because we associate you know money with value you know, naturally in a capitalist society we devalue the work we do when we're not making money at it so the um and, and at, by the same token, actually, if you're ever trying to organize a tour, um, the best the best gig or organizers are the ones that know they have to pay you. You know, the, <laughs> you know, really. I mean, the ones that think that you'll play for free are the ones that are going to organize gigs you don't want to do anyway. You know, so that's that's also another thing. I mean, you know, pe we do value money in the in this world, mm -hmm. and not just in this country. But uh, you know, we value money, and and money represents value. And that's how it is. I mean, that's what money is for, to represent the value of something, right? And and that's obviously very limited because it only represents right. some forms of value, right? But we value it in, in society and, and, and we need it as well. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of, especially young artists who have never known what it's like to have a purely transactional relationship in a sense with your audience where they like your music, they buy your CDs. And it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. Like you don't need to convince them anything. You don't need to. You, know, <laughs> you, you don't need to tell them how much you're suffering. You don't need to tell them how much your rent is or any of that stuff. You don't need to beg. You don't need to. You don't need to bury your heart. You just need to. You know. I mean, nothing wrong with any of those things. I do all those things all the time now. That's how I survive. <laughs> begging and burying my heart online. Right. That's how we all survive. If we're doing it, we're on Patreon. We have to appeal to people and to convince them. We need you. We need your support because we're not making any money any other way. And then we get the support and it works. Crowdfunding works for some of us who are good at begging, you know, mm -hmm. who are humble enough to, to beg or or narcissistic enough to beg or something. The weird combination of narcissism and humility that's required to do good <laughs> begging on Patreon. I don't know what it is, but this is what we have to do. And, you know, according to my polling of fellow artists, 71 percent of artists that I polled don't want to even try begging online. Because they just are appalled by the idea. The other 29% are 
are willing to try and you know of those some succeed so you know just looking at that and you know and and if you can assume that that's probably a rel relevant statistic for a lot of other people you can see we're we're losing so many people in the modern arts economy and uh, there's a lot of you know less than half as many people i think now actually even claim to be artists on their tax forms than mm -hmm. 20 years ago and that's because they're not artists in the in the economical sense right mm -hmm. they may be artists but they're not making any money at it right so they they don't officially claim to be artists because it's irrelevant for their income. So they're not going to say that on the tax form. So it's like, I think it was like between two censuses, something like 43% as many people in the <laughs> US uh, were, are calling themselves. I think I got a lot of this stuff from a great book called The Death of the Artist written okay. in, in uh, October 2020 by a Portland uh, author. But um, yeah, it's, um, I, I, I would say, you know, that first of all, I would say, it is possible to make a living as an artist in the modern era and and young people should recognize that this is possible and that your art you know may, if other people think it has value then it does have value whether or not it has finance whether they're placing financial value on it or not like mm -hmm. i would say to artists if you if you have um you know thousands of monthly listeners on spotify for example you know which a lot of people do you can you can find a way to monetize that through crowdfunding uh, platforms and you can make a living at this and don't think that your only option is to just record more music and and put more music out there and somehow get bigger and more popular and eventually you'll you'll uh, make a living through spotify that probably will never happen to you you know no matter even if you're really really good you know because mm -hmm. you have to be in the top like 0.1 percent or less of a spotify artists to really make that kind of money you know but you know you can get millions of streams a year and you're still not going to make anything close to enough money to survive you know so mm -hmm. so you can forget about that model of 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 getting so popular that you can survive that's that's definitely one piece of advice i'd say and to folks and just focus on appealing to your core audience you know, if you've got a core audience, obviously you need a core audience first. But if you have a core audience, you know, if it's a if it's like somewhere in the realm of a few thousand monthly listeners on Spotify, you have a big enough audience to make a living. But you're not going to make it through Spotify. That's what and 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 you know, making a living matters. And just because most artists are not making a living at it, I mean, you know, if you want to make a living at it, and you know, it is conceivable that you can. And and I think that is. Um, you know, that's something that just needs to be said, perhaps, because I think so many young artists don't even think that it's even remotely possible to make a living at it. And if they're not famous enough, then they figure, well, other people who aren't famous enough aren't making a living at it. Why should I? And, well, that's a good point. But, you know, it basically, you know, unfortunately, it comes down to your business acumen, you know, and I, and I, I hate to say it, but it is absolutely the case that if you no matter how good you are as a songwriter, as a musician, as an artist or anything like that, you have to be a business person too, or else you're not going to get anywhere on a financial level. You might get an audience. Uh, you, you might, if you're good at getting your music out there, um, you know, and sharing it, you know, that's a form of marketing. It's not going to make you money necessarily, but it, so you might get an audience, but if you, and, and that's great. But if you, if your goal is to any, make any kind of money at this, uh, at, at music to survive at it, to be able to pay for future recordings, to do all, any of those things that musicians like to do, to be able to do tours and all that stuff, then you, especially if you want to set up a tour, you know, after the pandemic is over, you know, you must, you are running a business and, and you have to, you have to fully embrace that fact because at every level of the music industry from the very from from you know anybody who's making any kind of a living from you know the bottom to the top on the financial scale they're all we are all business people and you can't avoid that and you know if you and and you can you can't avoid it if you just want to be an artist and you don't want to make any money that's fine you know you can avoid the business of it you know you you might not be able to finance you know, good recordings, unless you parents give you your money or you get some other source of income, you got, you got a day job or whatever, that's great. But if you want to finance recordings, if you want to make a living at this in any form, make any kind of money at it, you have to embrace the fact that you are a sole proprietor or you're, if you're a band, you're a, you're a group, it's more than a sole proprietor, you know, but mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, whether you have a manager or not, 
if you're your own manager, you're your manager. <laughs> you know, if you're if you have a booking agent or not, if you're your own booking agent, you are a booking agent, you know, and you have to act like one. And if you're your own manager and your own booking agent and you're the songwriter and you're the producer and you're the engineer and you're the janitor, you have to be all of those things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's great if you can get somebody else to do some of those things. But the, the really, really nasty part of the whole thing is that even if you get somebody else to do any of those things, you still have to be participating in that process. If you have a manager, what's your manager going to do? They're going to say, you have to wake up tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. You have an interview at 730. You know, and I mean, that's what you're. So then what do you do? You have to set your alarm. You mm -hmm. have to get out of bed. You, you have to be awake and ready to do the interview at 730. You know, so it's like it's it's a, yeah, it's easier to work with a manager. I mean, I hear not that I've ever done it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you still have to set your alarm. You still have to maintain your calendar. You still can't forget those interviews like I used to do all the time. <laughs> you know, you know, you have to because Google Calendar has saved my life. I mean, I, I don't know what I did so. without it. <laughs> And, you know, I could get to gigs, but I could never do anything else before Google Calendar. And I, you know, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It reminds me of what you were saying earlier about how there are just so many, even setting aside like racism and classism, which of course are like huge things is that there are, it's just so much harder for independent artists because all of this apparatus is already in place with the big three record labels. Right. Is that like, yep. if you're yep. signed to EMI, <laughs> you're done. Like you got everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, then well, then at least you have this whole this whole support uh, yeah. system, and then you it doesn't guarantee your success, but what it does guarantee is EMI is going to. I mean, well, things are changing, but as at least a few years ago, you know, when EMI, when one of those labels would sign an artist, it used to be anyway, even just very, and sometimes often still is, they're going to spend a lot of money to to launch as they call it that artist, and and at even even today, you know. It, at least in any kind of a real, not if it's not just a distribution deal, distribution deals can really suck. I mean, that that's mm -hmm. often pointless. You can, that can be worse than pointless. Um, especially when nobody's buying physical, <laughs> anything. forget of a distribution deals, but, but if you're actually signed to a major label and they're actually promoting you, they're going to spend $50,000 easily. That's little money. That's, that's change for them, you know? And, but then if, if a label spends $50,000 to launch your career, even if they don't get what they're looking for out of it, uh, they've still gotten you a bunch of publicity. Yeah. And if you're good at, at writing that and, 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 and working with that, you can get gigs and you can get fans and you can get more fans and you can make money off of that publicity. But if you're not good at writing it, then it's just going to kind of, you know, go by the wayside after a few years and, and it's it's not going to be as easy to to use what they've done. So I mean, but yeah, it is. Uh, th there's ways you can you can sort of leverage even uh, you know getting signed and then dropped from a label. I've known a lot of people who've who've made actually decades of good independent careers in the music scene because they were famous in 1982. <laughs> the, you know, there's a lot of punk musicians who were famous yeah. in 1982 for like a month. And uh, but you can do a lot with uh, one month of fame. If you are on the cover of a few magazines in 1982, at least people who were around back then, you can, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, their kids, you know, <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. This was really great. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. I'll just. <laughs>